Thank you. It's great to, uh, to be here this afternoon and to, to talk about a topic which is uh, really dear to my heart. How can we uh, make sure that AI can help us respond to people when they're, uh, when they're most in need? Uh, so I'm, I'm Robert Munro. I'm the CTO of a company called Figure8. Um, until recently, we were known as Crowdflower. You might be familiar with that as the company name, recently rebranded. Uh, so we make the um, most widely used software for annotating training data um, and uh, build complete AI systems that go from raw data to uh, deployed models. Uh, so if your, your car parks itself, your music uh, is based on recommendations, uh, your fruit is scanned between farm and table, you're probably using AI that, uh, that we ship. Um, uh, but today I'm going to talk about um, one particular application, uh, AI for disaster response. Uh, because this was actually uh, my path. Uh, so my path in artificial intelligence was, was not a typical one. Uh, out of undergraduate, while I'd studied AI, um, I didn't really expect uh, to have a career in it um, because there really weren't careers um, uh, back at that time. Uh, and so I, I went and, and worked as a, an engineer globally. Um, and I had uh, this one experience in the, in the mid-2000s. So I was working uh, for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. I was working in... Uh, refugee camps in Liberia and in Sierra Leone, where I was, I was living at the time, um, and we were installing uh, solar power systems at schools and clinics uh, supporting refugee camps uh, so that these schools and clinics could be uh, more self-sufficient. And uh, it was while I was there at, at one of these uh, very remote clinics in Liberia um, that I was standing there, we were already kind of like late getting in to, to build this system, we had just two days, we had to move on to the next place. And, and someone came up to me in this village, and they're like, hey, I, I, you know, we think um, some new refugees just came over the border from Cote d'Ivoire um, into the, the neighboring valley, but you know, we don't know much about them. And of course, they came up to me, because you know, we were the, the ones there um, uh, you know, with, uh, working for the UN Refugee Commission and, and installing solar power. But frustratingly, we couldn't find out anything about them. Um, it was just one valley over. We didn't know if there were 10 or 10,000 uh, refugees there. And what was especially frustrating is that I had five bars of cell phone reception. I had perfect cell phone reception, and no doubt some of the refugees did as well. And they'll probably bounce in their cell phone signals off that, that same tower that I was. But even if I could connect with them, uh, they would have spoken one of a, a half a dozen local languages uh, for which uh, there certainly weren't machine translation systems. And other AI that we took for granted even 15 years ago, like search engines and spam filtering, it wouldn't have worked in any of those languages uh, as well. Um, so even if we could connect, there wasn't much we could do. Uh, ultimately, uh, in this use case, we just had to uh, report back to uh, the capital Monrovia that maybe there's refugees there. We don't know how many we, we weren't able to find out. Uh, and so that, that really motivated me because I thought, well, you know, I'm not really needed to be on a roof drilling in uh, solar panels. Like a, a lot of people can do that. Uh, someone employed locally can do that. But I had studied AI, so I thought, well, how can I help AI uh, be adapted to uh, more languages? And so that's what motivated me then at that time uh, to move to Silicon Valley, uh, where I got a PhD focused on natural language processing for health and disaster response at Stanford, um, looking at how we can adapt it to, to low resource languages in, in this context. Um, and while I did that, I, I continued to work in disaster response. and so. The first time we were able to deploy AI in, in disaster response uh, was in 2010. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you remember in 2010, uh, a very large earthquake hit Haiti uh, in January of that year. Uh, more than 100,000 people were killed immediately, and uh, more than a million people were, were left homeless. And so working with uh, a number of people in the international response community, uh, we're able to set up a, a phone number, like a 911, or I guess I should say, is it, I'm mean, going to forget, a triple one? In, in the UK, is that the equivalent of 911? 999, all right. Everyone who's visiting, take note in case you're in an emergency later. Um, so we're able to set up the equivalent of a, of a 999 service um, in Haiti because most of their cell phone towers were, were still working. Uh, calls weren't getting through, but, but text messages were. Uh, so on broadcast radio, we could advertise that people could call the service to, to report their needs um, or, or resources if they had any. Um, and we could have link them with international responders. Uh, but we had this problem in that the majority of text messages were sent in Haitian Creole, um, the, the one language that, that most people spoke there. And the majority of the international response community only spoke English as their, as their common language. So messages like you could see on the left, uh, which were really important, so a hospital running out of supplies, uh, someone undergoing a, a childbirth, someone needing search and rescue, couldn't be understood by the people coming into the country. 
Uh, so it fell on me uh, to find and manage uh, people who spoke both English and Haitian Creole uh, to do real-time translation, categorization, and mapping uh, of these messages so that a, a plain text message sent in Haitian Creole um, could be an English report categorized with the, the exact longitude and latitude through the international response community. Uh, so in 48 hours, I was able to, to find and ultimately manage about 2,000 members of the Haitian diaspora um, who uh, were able to join us from uh, 49 countries worldwide um, and in real time uh, be able to uh, complete this translation um, and use their, their local knowledge in, in a way that wouldn't, um, just simply wouldn't be possible if you weren't from that region. Uh, we're also integrating with AI systems here. So taking a message in Haitian Creole and its English translation, we're able to, to feed that parallel data to machine translation engines at Microsoft and at Google, um, and they quickly released uh, the first ever machine translation systems for Haitian Creole and English um, uh, within a week of the disaster, uh, based in part off the, the data that we were able to give to them uh, for emergency messages. And as many of you who work in machine learning will know, that the fact that these were um, uh, kind of somewhat messy social messages and they're about the topics of, of health and disaster response means that the machine translation systems were then also better in, in messages related to, to health and, and disaster response. Um, and uh, one of the big takeaways here was the importance of engaging uh, the local community in this process. Uh, so just imagine, right, that we'd already solved the problem of machine translation and you had a message that, that looked like this. Uh, Sacred Heart Hospital in the, the village of OCAP is, is ready to receive patients. Uh, so looking at this map here, who can, who can see OCAP on, on this map? No one? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in a little. I'm going to tell you it's up here. Anyone? OCAP? Nope. I'm going to zoom in once more. See it now? No, right, it's difficult to see. So OCAP's actually slang uh, for capacien. And once you're told that, it kind of makes sense. Uh, so capacien with the C-A-P in the language becomes K-A-P, the same way a hard C and a K might alternate in English and German. Um, o is a marker for a location, just by coincidence, as, you know, as it uh, can be in, in um, uh, Gallic. Um, and so these follow linguistically consistent rules, but if you don't know what this slang word is, you can spend a long time looking for this. And Capacien is the, the second largest city after Port-au-Prince in Haiti. This isn't a small city. So your knowledge of, of the existence of this city might, might not be enough. Uh, and so uh, working with these Haitians worldwide, they were able to, to use their linguistic knowledge, um, but also their local knowledge. Because if you're from there, you would actually know that Sacred Heart Hospital uh, was about 15 kilometers south of the... Uh, the city itself in a, in a smaller town called Malat. Uh, so again, something very important if you're evacuating, in this case by helicopter, uh, people to a, a given, um, given location. Uh, so to show one example of um, uh, people collaborating to, to find this out, uh, so here we have uh, two people collaborating, Delilah in San Francisco, Apo in, in Montreal, uh, to try and uh, geolocate a message. So on this online chat where people are coordinating, uh, Delilah is saying, Thomason, Apple, please. So where, where is Thomason? And, and Apple immediately replies, here is the, the longitude and latitude. It's in this area after Pertheonville. Um, uh, Google Maps isn't there. And if you look at Google Maps at the time, you can see that, yes, like this is just a bend in the road. None of the suburbs or, or roads are labeled there. Uh, but Apple grew up there. So he can drop a pin exactly, um, uh, which generates a longitude and latitude, uh, which means that the, the responders can um, uh, go out and address this issue. Uh, in this case, it was a breach birth. Um, uh, so it was nice that this was probably going to be a, a troubled birth regardless. And so for a small period of time following this disaster, uh, they had some of the, the best physicians in the world able to, to respond to, to this particular uh, medical emergency. I think it's very interesting that, you know, because I know this place like my pocket. I know this place like the back of my hand. Um, and Delilah says, well, thank God you were here. And it's interesting to, to think about where here is. I mean, did here mean the online chat room? Is it San Francisco? Is it Montreal? Or, or is it with Haiti? It, it shows how people can uh, collaborate globally um, in order to um, uh, work together uh, to solve some of the, our biggest problems. And so uh, that was my path. Uh, disaster response uh, to Stanford University. I founded a few companies in um, AI space in San Francisco. Immediately before joining Figure 8, I was running product for natural language processing and translation at AWS, um, helping convince them to be multilingual 
um, in their first ever products, which I think uh, itself um, helps a lot of people. And uh, the reason this is important is that um, I wonder, what, you know, what's your intuition? So how much of the world's conversations daily uh, is English? On a given day, how many of the world's conversations are in the English language? So the answer is 5%. Uh, just 5% of the world's conversations are in English, and that's fairly consistent. But about 95% of AI uh, only works in English or only works well in English. And if you speak a, a minority language, you're disproportionately more likely uh, to be the victim of a man-made or a natural disaster. Um, and also, uh, education between men and women uh, will favor men for dominant languages. Um, and you get the same divisions across ethnicity. Uh, in fact, uh, race in parts of the Amazon is determined by your language uh, more than your actual ethnicity. Um, so this linguistic bias is, is also a, a, a gender and, and a racial bias that we have in our AI today. And I think this is the, uh, one of the biggest problems that we're facing is uh, what AI technologies are available for, for everybody in the world. Uh, so one really interesting and also linguistic use case uh, that I've worked on, um, again, before I joined the company, we're using figure eights technology, uh, is epidemic tracking. Um, so this is the, the famous map from uh, Jon Snow, like not that Jon Snow, but the 1800s Jon Snow, um, uh, who uh, discovered a cholera outbreak um, uh, using geographic information mapping um, uh, just uh, down the road here in London. And so um, uh, disease outbreaks are, are still uh, the largest killer in the world, um, and no organization is tracking them all. You might have seen movies where people have great big screens and it's a heat map and it flares up every time there's an outbreak. That doesn't exist anywhere. Um, and the budgets for those movies probably exceed the budgets of any one organization actually tracking uh, disease outbreaks globally. And this is pretty scary, because uh, in the last 75 years, we've only eliminated one human disease, uh, smallpox, um, and the amount of air travel um, has increased greatly. And we definitely put a lot of resources into uh, stopping terrorists uh, getting onto flights. Um, but a, a pathogen is more likely to sneak onto a flight undetected um, and certainly being responsible for um, many more of the, the world's deaths. And the reason that this is the linguistic problem is that 90% uh, of the world's pathogens come from this thin band of the tropics. So this thin band of the tropics has 90% of the world's ecological diversity, including the things that can kill us. Um, by maybe coincidence, maybe not, uh, the same thin band of the tropics has 90% of the world's linguistic diversity. Uh, so what that means is that the first time that somebody notices an outbreak, they're speaking about it in one of 6,000 different languages. Um, and chances are that that, that language is, is not, um, not English or, or Spanish or, or, or Mandarin. It's not a dominant language. So uh, we can actually go back in time and uh, find reports of disease outbreaks weeks, months, sometimes decades uh, before they'll finally put in front of virologists and identify it as being a, um, a new pathogen that we need to track. Every single transmission is a possibility that these could mutate to become more fatal, and so we want to uh, get ahead of any outbreak as soon as possible. So in the case of swine flu, we can find cables coming out of uh, southern China weeks ahead of when this was identified as H1N5, as a, as a new strain of the flu that hadn't been identified before. Um, in the case of bird flu, uh, we can find local newspaper reports in Mexico months before it was identified as a new strain of the flu with telltale symptoms, like all the young people are sick in the village at the moment. Um, so if you're a virologist and epidemiologist, you're like, oh, right, this is obviously like a, a new strain of the flu. Um, but uh, in this paper, it was just remarked upon and um, uh, missed. Um, in the case of something like HIV, we can go back decades uh, to, to find this kind of information. So simply finding these reports as early as possible um, can help prevent e epidemics. Uh, so Epidemic I IQ is an initiative that uh, was trying to take millions of reports worldwide and find out, okay, which of these are relevant to disease outbreaks so that the 15 to 20 per day, which really are, um, new disease outbreaks that we care about can be put in front of the, uh, the right epidemiologist and, and virologist for review. Uh, so for those of you who speak uh, Russian, Arabic, or um, what's the third language up there, uh, uh, Mandarin, um, you will see that uh, these are uh, disease outbreaks uh, categorized by the, the type of disease, um, the location that it's in, uh, the number of people in, infected. So we're able to uh, use machine learning to filter that anything that might look like a disease, uh, put this in front of crowdsourced workers, microtaskers for review, um, have them correct or uh, reject uh, the given machine learning analysis, 
finally put that in front of the domain experts for review uh, with all of that information from the uh, analyst going back to the machine learning model so it continually updated, uh, adapting in uh, about 15 uh, different languages, including some here in Europe. Uh, so in 2011, uh, there was an outbreak of E. coli in, in Germany that um, had a number of fatalities. And we're able to show using this kind of online tracking of uh, newspaper articles and social media in German uh, that we could get ahead of the European CDC in identifying the, the outbreaks and, and where they occurred. Uh, it's something I've used in, in smaller languages as well. Uh, so in partnership with UNICEF, using the same human in the loop AI process uh, to adapt to um, a number of local languages uh, in Nigeria. Uh, in this case, uh, it was called the First Thousand Days Program. So from when a woman learns that she is pregnant for the following uh, thousand days through birth and beyond, uh, tracking things like the number of uh, vaccinations, uh, the ongoing weight and changing weight of the child in, in order to help with maternal care. Um, again, having language independent AI um, that local analysts within Nigeria who spoke those languages uh, could uh, encode and then adapt uh, to their given use cases. Um, and then we're just starting to see more, more use cases in computer vision in addition to natural language processing. Uh, so the company I was at at the time, we hosted aerial imagery analysis following Hurricane Sandy uh, to identify what was not just a, uh, a marshland but an actually flooded region, uh, which FEMA used to, to help uh, decide where to uh, deploy their resources. Uh, right through to some interesting use cases um, on our product today where people are using computer vision uh, in sub-Saharan Africa to track um, elephants and people who are near elephants uh, in order to identify areas where there, there might be poachers um, uh, encroaching on the, on the herds. Um, and uh, something we're really proud to announce uh, just a, a few weeks ago now is that uh, we've made uh, eight new open, uh, open data sets um, available on our platform, uh, all of which tackle either a social good problem or a particularly hard problem in machine learning. Um, and uh, two of them are particularly related uh, to disaster response. Uh, so this is a map of the, uh, some of the different dedicated workforces that we have on, on, on our platform. Uh, and as an extension, they speak a number of different languages. So in this case, this is speakers of uh, Swahili uh, helping us in partnership with the Red Cross um, create Swahili recordings of uh, a number of health and disaster response related messages in, um, in the Swahili language with translations to English uh, so that online translation systems and speech recognition systems uh, can become better across all these languages. Uh, so that's uh, Swahili uh, trans uh, translation, speech, and transcription. Um, and then uh, happy to announce that uh, as of tomorrow, we'll have a new data set available, uh, which is a collection of, of text messages, including the ones in Haiti, uh, across a number of disasters, um, encoded for a, a number of common uh, disaster response topics. And again, it's an open data set, uh, so we're uh, really hoping that anyone in the machine learning community um, can experiment on this data set, uh, tell us trends about what communicate, people communicate in disasters um, that we don't already know, um, uh, and then also uh, come up with machine learning solutions uh, that can help us automate or, or semi-automate the disaster re response process going forward. So uh, uh, thank you all for your time. I think I, I burned all my question time right now. I, I think um, I'm getting a nod back there, but I will be available at the, um, uh, the speaker room uh, after this session immediately following. All right, thank you all.